Welcome back to the, uh, the second uh, class on environmental change. This one is on natural climate vari variability. So um, in the previous course, I focused on uh, the nasty things that we've been doing to our planet, especially the last 50 years. This, um, this class, I'll be talking in more detail about the natural occurring climate variability. Um, and I mentioned it also in the previous class. These are, what was one of them? Any remember? I think uh, Guillermo probably knows it quite well. It affects South America, specifically. Any ideas? El Nino. El Nino, yeah. So the uh, the, the southern oscillations, southern Atlantic oscillations, also called El Nino and La Nina. But there is also one in Europe. I will be talking about the North Atlantic oscillations. And there's a third one called uh, the Pineapple Express, um, which goes through, I, people are funny, and when people laugh, I know why they're laughing. <laughs> I know, just so you know, yeah, right, right, right. The, uh, the term Pineapple Express was made for this weather oscillation, oscillation in the Northern Pacific. Then there was a movie and a, a certain uh, plant named after it also, and that's why some people giggle when they hear Pineapple Express. Um, okay, we'll talk about that. But uh, here we go. So variations on the Earth's surfaces in the Northern Hemisphere for approximately the last thousand years, as I, I've mentioned before. Oops, it doesn't look very well. Very good. But it, it has oscillated quite a bit, and sometimes even extremely so. But it's normally a, a, a cyclical cycle, so it goes up and down a little bit. And in the last century, it's uh, it's uh, it's gone up, and the, the temperature has gone up quite quickly. But what 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 is all of this? So we focused quite often we focus on this last hundred years. But what happens before that? Why is there so much variation uh, in the past? So there are different uh, causes of climate variability. You have, uh, uh, we always we often talk about uh, the, the Earth being a closed system, but it's not completely closed actually because we get a lot of uh, energy from the sun. So it's external forcing of the climate changes. Um, but also we have ice ages, uh, which have to do with the, the distance between the sun and the Earth the angle and the rotation of the axis, um, but these are very, 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 very slow. So this is outside of the Earth. There are uh, volcanic eruptions. Mount Pinatubo was probably the last uh, big one in the Philippines, am I correct? And uh, Mount uh, and Krakatoa, that was in Indonesia, uh, which had uh, a global impact. We'll be talking about uh, um, uh, Pinatubo, not about uh, the other one, Krakatoa, but uh, they've had lasting, lasting effects globally, but also internal climate system variabilities. Um, and to be honest, we're not sure why uh, why these uh, this happens. But specifically, we're talking about El Nino, La Nina. It's the same uh, thing. It's a cycle, and North Atlantic Oscillation. So Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991. Um, Mount Pinatubo is a volcano. It's a quite, quite an active volcano. And since 91, it has had uh, small eruptions, but not as big as the one in 91. In 91, uh, the eruption was captured um, on pictures. Uh, I, you, a lot of you probably weren't even born then. Uh, but I was. I remember it. It was big in the news when I was um, a young a whippersnapper. And obviously, you can imagine if you live in this area, the ash, the amount of, uh, of CO2 coming from, from the, coming from the volcano has massive devastating effects. Uh, if you are anywhere near the volcano, uh, obviously what you see is very deadly. Uh, if, but what's the, it's actually coming out, the CO2, the SO2, it's uh, just as deadly, if not deadlier. Uh, and it has large waning effects. CO2 is heavier than air, so um, anybody uh, living around there would die because there would be no oxygen, it would be pure CO2. 
satellite imagery uh, from the time of the Mount Pinatubo. We've talked about aerosols. Now we are all experts on aerosols. Uh, chemists call them aerosols. Some people call them particulate, particulate matter. Escaping from a volcano. This is pre, uh, pre volcanic eruption. Uh, this is satellite imagery, if I didn't say that. This is uh, shortly after, just a few months after, you see a large band of the particulate matter, the uh, aerosols spreading around the uh, equator. And then, of a process of um, another six months, it, these particulate matter surrounded the Earth. So, what effect now is my question to you? Aerosols. Can we remember from just a few hours ago? What effect would aerosols have on the climate? Mm -mm. No. Slightly op the opposite, actually. Aerosols block. Huh? Also, it would, it would deplete the ozone on a lar larger scale uh, because there would, ozone is created by UV, UV radiation. But it would actually, because it, it's part of the albedo effect, if there is ash, if there's particulate matter, and other things, it re reflects, it reflects uh, sunlight. But you're another, you, actually, Anthony, you're, or Anthony, you're actually right that it has a small, that the, the cooling effect is um, mitigated by the amount of greenhouse gases coming out. Yeah, it's. It's a net negative effect in the fact that it cools slightly, um, but it does also um, cause CO2. So it's not only a, a negative effect, it's also a, a net positive greenhouse effect. So here's a, a, another cr cross section, let's say. It's the sun coming in. Here is the aerosols coming from. Uh, oh, sorry, oh, I didn't l see, uh, see that, Peter. Uh, yeah, for one one point for uh, for Peter. It's exactly so. <laughs> the sun comes in; it's blocked by the the ash in the uh, in the atmosphere, and it's reflected back. So it increases the albedo effect. And remember uh, that. So it's solar radiation times one minus the albedo is the amount of radiation coming into our planet. There we go. So the albedo effect is increased, therefore the amount of uh, solar radiation is decreased. So that's how uh, volcanic eruptions affect our climate. And again, how long does this effect have? Uh, people are keeping points. Any idea how long of effect do you think this is going to have an effect of a thousand years, a hundred years, ten years, one year? Not not too terribly long, um, not a volcano. Even I would say even yeah, uh, Peter uh, Peter, that's correct. It's even even less than that. I would say one to five years, depending on uh, how uh, big this eruption was. Krakatoa was even bigger than Pinatubo, so I think it lasted uh, up to five years. But Pinatubo, uh, I think about a couple of years, one or two years. It had an effect. Eventually, eventually the particulates come down. They they get into the clouds, and the clouds, you know, rain. Yeah. Maybe I don't understand the significance of that. An aerosol. What's the difference from an aerosol? Is it like ash? Ash is another word for a an aerosol. Is any as any uh, molecule of clumped. Uh, yeah, it's a particle of any clumped particles. Yeah, it just just foul. You know, when you see when you see the exhaust coming from a diesel car. That's aerosols. Pollutants. Yeah, pollutants is a is general term. Aerosols is uh, a pollutant can be in the water, a pollutant can be in the ground, uh, can be uh, it can actually be a microorganism. Um, uh, 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 an aerosol is a airborne pollutant of a certain size. Okay, so the global climate forcings. You see the radiative force, and here we go. Yeah, so it just lasts uh, just a few years, and then uh, it goes back. Yeah, so this is the radiative force. This is the average radiative force. And then uh, volcanoes will erupt. Uh, the large forest fires also have, have an effect. The forest, fire, f the forest fire in Australia, as I mentioned, has an effect.
uh, but um, the radiative force by greenhouse effect is much larger. Yeah, so I'll go back. We have small punctuated effects over just a few years from the volcanoes. It's a negative effect. And this is the greenhouse, uh, greenhouse effect. Okay. And the ozone is, is uh, going down. Ozone is a yeah. Ozone is a, uh, um, a greenhouse gas. It's just disappearing, um, but it's, uh, it's coming back. Solar forcing from uh, from sunspots. Have you guys heard of some sunspots? Well, here's a photograph of the sun. Uh, again, for Dutch people, the sun is a fire fireball in the sky. You don't see it very often. Maybe you've never encountered it. But uh, here is a picture of the sun. Ha ha, enough jokes, Nathan. Especially the same jokes. It gets to you. Um, the sun, uh, they develop, uh, the, it's, not, it's not all the same. The, same. the sun is not a continuous surface. You probably all know this, but I'll repeat it. We have certain spots in the sun which are much cooler and uh, they don't give as much radiation. These sunspots, they do last for years, um, and sometimes they get, there are more of them, sometimes there are less of them, uh, and sometimes they're bigger and sometimes they're smaller. So that also uh, causes a, uh, a cooling effect. Uh, Galileo discovered this around 1610. So, and also these little spots, they're about the size of the Earth, by the way. So uh, we forget how big the sun is, really. Here is the daily sunspot um, for solar uh, rotation. We uh, make a trip around the sun once every year. Yeah, if you didn't know that. <laughs> I hope you did. Uh, it's been a long day. Um, the average daily sunspot area of the visible hemisphere, sometimes, as you see, they grow. We, what do you notice about this? Yeah? Do you, need, you, do you notice something? They match, yeah, that's a pattern. Um, it's not understood. There is about an 11-year cycle. There have been longer cycles, um, and, and, we, and we don't know why. Uh, it's every 11 years. Uh, there's sometimes there are more sunspots. Sometimes there are less. Maybe one of you will uh, go out and uh, discover the reason why. But they've been most, mostly even. The... Uh, the, and since the 1700s, again, the Galileo uh, uh, noticed them for the first time, and uh, they've they've been growing and coming down huh? for since 1700, more than 300 years. From 1750, we've been uh, measuring them um, more and more, and uh, these are the forcings. Again, let's look at the scale. Uh, this is 0 0.2. This is not huge variations and would not uh, ne necessarily um, uh, not necessarily uh, lead to higher temperatures on our planet. Almost one yeah, sure. I'll go back. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Well, these are different people have studied it, and um, yeah, this is what they found. Remember that uh, we're working with uh, evidence from uh, historical evidence. So uh, the further further back you go in time, the more difficult it is to research. And uh, um, I, I I challenge you to to uh, find information on uh, uh, solar radiation from 1750. It's quite difficult. So there have been different uh, articles written which disagree, and it's by the same person too, by the way. So. Uh, and how, how fitting, the, the person's name is Solar, and he's studying the sun, or she. It, it, he, obviously, the closer you get to 2000, the more reliable uh, the, the research has been, because we've been searching, we've been, uh, we've been studying the sun quite intensely since around the 70s. It's, it's extremely difficult to study the sun, 
it's easy to, uh, to, to study other uh, stars, but our own star, it's so cl close by, yeah? It's n normally, in astronomy, uh, getting the light is a difficulty, but in the sun, it's, it's the opposite, too much light. For example, you can look at the stars, you can't look at the sun, not for very long. Right, so here we have the forcings. Um, we have to put things in perspective. The solar forcings has like what a 0 0.2, and there's a, there is a lot of variation, but the solar forcings is on the on a scale of about 0 0.2 plus or minus. The the rest, all of the anthropogenic ones, have a much uh, much larger impact. So um, th the conclusion that you could cr draw, and I do gr uh, draw this conclusion, also the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, has drawn this conclusion, is that, uh, of course, there are natural radiative forces that change. However, it does not, it's not enough compared to uh, what the anthropogenic sources have been. It's nowhere near enough to, uh, to show the problems that we've had in the last 50 years. Now to um, El Nino, uh, La Nina, it's called the Southern Oscillations, or ENSO. ENSO is uh, uh, w uh, one of the main causes of global climate variation. It's, mo it's larger than the North Atlantic oscillations. Uh, El Nino is an ocean-atmosphere interaction. W what is that, Nathan? We'll see that shortly. Uh, winds, ocean temperatures, and cloud rainfall patterns all change during the El Nino and La Nina years. It also is a cyclical cycle between Sometimes it's two years, sometimes it's 10 years. Um, it lasts uh, a year to a year and a half. It's irregular. We don't understand why, to be honest. It, uh, there are s strong El Niños that can r raise global temperatures by about 0 0.3 degrees Celsius. So this is um, quite a large phenomenon. It's larger than volcanoes, larger than um, than solar uh, solar black spots, solar spots. The impacts are, for example, fishing, uh, biology, birds, uh, coral bleaching because of high sea temperatures, rainfall, not just through South America, but actually into North America, global telecommunications, uh, and modulates uh, strength of tropical storms. So if uh, I'll get to it, but in a El, N El Nino year, the tropical storms uh, will be harder in South America and less hard in Asia. And the opposite, uh, the typhoons in Asia will be stronger in La Nina, which is a the low oscillation, and dry on the west coast of South America. Okay, here we go. Sea surface anomalies. Uh, this is this is uh, uh, Australia here, and this is the northwest part of South America. And here you see uh, Central uh, America, um, and this is the the snapshot of the temperature. And this is the difference in temperature between normal and normal, and uh, and El Nino, and the East Coast. On the east part, it'll be raised by about 2.5. Yeah, and then here it'll be cooler. I'll get into more details. Here's a normal condition. So it's cool, cooler in uh, South America. And therefore, the water streams to the left, where it's warmer. Again, of course, around the equator, off the northeast coast of Australia. Warm water will... Um, will uh, evaporate, causing uh, clouds, and move that way. But the rain is spaced here. Uh, it's the monsoon season in Asia when this happens. It's also uh, tropical storms, typhoons. It's the rainy season. If you've ever been to Southeast Asia, it's, uh, it's the basic rainy season where it rains for four months. But under El Nino conditions, uh, the water goes the opposite way. It, it warms up 
uh, on the coast of South America. And now the equator, the water is moving from the west to the east, and it brings the clouds also. And instead of doing here, you see a looping pattern. It's now welling up in the center of the uh, uh, Pacific, this is, and moving to the east. Yeah, so this brings, yeah, Anthony. Oh, that is uh, that is the um, the the, the coldness level of the water. So here it's it's cold. Uh, this is a uh, like a thermocline. Uh, do you know what thermocline is? That's when that's when the temperature changes dramatically, um, and then the temperature change is towards the surface here, and it's further down because it's it's absorbing more energy in the, in in the surface yeah so thermocline is very high in normal conditions and very low in only new conditions in lakes we feel that the thermocline, thermocline is, is normally quite high if you've ever jumped in a lake and your toes get really cold that's the thermocline in lakes okay again uh, this is a, um, a model of the, a normal water temperatures across the equator and this is an El Nino so obviously uh, here it's much warmer towards the Australian side because the waters are going from east to west. And uh, in El Nino years, uh, it's going from west to east. And that's why sometimes we say this is a, like a, a La Nina, it's going east to west, and El Nino is going west to east. Uh, uh, no, it's an, an, uh, an La Nina, which means the little girl. It goes to the west, so it's the water is warmer off the coast of Australia and Indonesia and Malaysia, and therefore the warm water means more evaporation. More evaporation means more clouds, and it rains more in the west. For El Nino, the water goes from west to east. The they have warm water on the east, so therefore the clouds form and drop on South America. So in La Nina years, there's more rain in Asia, and in El Nino years, there's more rain in South America. Okay? Yeah, it's the opposite. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to look at an El Nino happening. This is a, a snapshot of every few months of, uh, of, an El, uh, of, a, of a normal to El Nino condition. So this is, this is normal. We have warm a warm pocket, we don't understand really why it, it, it happens, but there's a warm pocket in the middle of uh, a middle of the uh, Pacific. And here, this is cold water. This is on the coast of Peru, yeah? so it's west of, it's west of uh, South America. So this is normal. Uh, in February, now a month later, the uh, warm water is spreading towards South America. And uh, sometimes we say um, OSST or SST, that's the observed sea surface temperature. In April, it's now increasing, it's reached, uh, it's reached central uh, Pacific and, and interacting with the winds further east. It goes closer and now has reached the coast of West South, South America. And now there's even a cold pocket in uh, in uh, Australia, we expect now, and as you see, uh, people talk quite often about the effect it has on South America. But if you look just a little bit further north, it's now spread across the entire west coast of of, uh, of North America, so Canada, United States, Mexico. They can also get a lot more rain. And uh, there you go. This is the Pacific looks like so the height of it. Now the the El Nino is now disappearing. The cool water is moving towards, uh, again, the west coast of South America. And that's it. That's the end part. This is normal, I'm putting in air quotes, normal conditions. Here are the, either are, uh, SSTs. So remember, that's the, uh, the surface, uh, surface sea temperatures along this uh, right here, this is approximately where north, uh, 
North South America is. That makes sense. The northern part of South America. Uh, in normal years, it's quite cool. Here is an El Nino event. Cool El Nino event. Cool El Nino event. No, just a few years later. And again, a few years later. And this one maybe in another, uh, what, it uh, looks like this is 1992. And this is 19... Let's, oh, it's opposite. So this is 88, and this is 92. So that uh, was a... So 86, that's like a eight year difference. And here's like just two years difference. And the last big one was in uh, 1997, but I think there was another one in, in the noughties. Did somebody tell me that uh, they heard that this is the strongest El Nino? Who mentioned that before? Philip, okay. So I, I guess, that who's the scorekeeper again? Does that mean Philip gets a point? <laughs> okay. It's uh, it's C, C surface temperature is correct, Peter. The, the ST is for surface temperature and S, the, fir the first S is for C. Right, so let's do it again. Here's, we can take, here's the equator. What the equator, well, not, not uh, there you go. Yeah. Anyway, more anomalies. So like I mentioned, the opposite of El Nino is La Nina. So uh, here we have warm water off the coast of uh, off the coast of South America. Now it's cool water, warm water, cool water, warm water, cool water, warm water. Uh, and here's 2012. I guess we are coming off of a La Nina. So that's about right. It sounds about right. You know, now we're coming into uh, El Nino. I'm glad I'm not living in the, <laughs> the west coast of uh, North or South America. And uh, we go back. Uh, we can see anomalies. I, I've, I've often wondered how they can go back to 1880. But uh, probably like trees. Uh, why not? Tree rings. You can cut down a tree and count the rings. The rings are thicker then uh, must be a rainy year. What about you guys? Any ideas? I have no idea. I'm not a I'm not an El Nino specialist. Yeah, there are some some instances that in the 97 one and I guess now uh, we've we've uh, learned this uh, this uh, El Nino is also uh, unusually large El Ninos. But then again, it's it's I have to say it's something we don't understand too well. So it's difficult to make assumptions about about the El Nino. I think it's something that we've only really understood uh, for like uh, 20 years uh, since we've been able to. It's the other thing about globalization is uh, information is flowing. Uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, even even worse, it was difficult to know when it was raining more or less in South America. Now we have a good communication around the world. There are lots of impacts of obvious reasons. Um, we have very warm uh, relationships in, uh, in El Nino and cooler in La Nina in the Northern Hemisphere. And then in June and August here in El Nino it's quite warm and in La Nina it's cool. So global facts. This is just a um, like a monthly, uh, a monthly look at the average historical probabilities of El Nino. Now we'll move on to the North Atlantic Oscillation I mentioned about. The North Atlantic Oscillation uh, we uh, see in Europe, and it um, has a more local effect, but it's uh, between uh, Europe. And um, and the east coast of North America, so the we call that the uh, the eastern seaboard of the United States, but also along Canada, to Greenland, um, and that's why sometimes we have a very cool summer in Europe or a very uh, wet summer, because uh, do you get you guys know what it's called? This uh, air stream that comes from 
North America to Europe? No? You have to know. Never heard of the Gulf Stream? Yeah? Oh, almost. Not Ulf Stream, but Gulf Stream. I, should we give him a point for Ulf Stream? I, I think so. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's called the Gulf. <laughs> It's uh, called the Gulf Stream, yeah. So um, the air goes from west to north, but because of uh, because of changing uh, air patterns, this is not always the case. Sometimes it goes more to the north when it reaches Europe. Sometimes it goes more to the south when it reaches Europe. Um, when the oscillation um, is very uh, uh, is is very positive, we'll have cold, dry. Uh, winters, and when it's a negative, sorry, we'll have mild and wet winters. My, my apologies. And uh, uh, when it's a negative, we'll have a cold and dry winter. So, and the last, no, 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 no. A Gulf Stream is uh, is, is is both. Uh, as no, it's definitely in in the air. There we go. We've learned something today. Here are for the North Atlantic. The NAO is the North Atlantic uh, Oscillation. Uh, yeah, actually, Philip, it's the other way around. Um, more often, uh, the ocean uh, the ocean temperatures affect the um, affect the air currents. So if it's if it's um, warm, it'll have high pressure, and high pressure normally goes to low pressure. But there are systems. The systems move around. Yeah. The uh, the winter mean NAO index. So let's look at this oscillation. So here we have 1950. It's normal. 1965 must have been a very cold uh, cold year. Uh, in 1995. So let's see where we're going. It looks like it's getting colder and colder and colder. So I'd I'd admit that this is where we're towards the peak of the cool. It's going to be a cold, a dry summer. Winter, I mean. Let's hope. I like ice skating on the canals, so I, I always hope for a cold, dry summer. Winter. Oh, Nathan. Okay, so. So how can we explain that? I'm trying to bring everything back because we only have two more sheets. Yay. Don't, don't all uh, clap at the same time. Uh, so all this climate variation... The natural climate variation that all explains all of all of this, but it doesn't explain this, and that's one of the points. So, um, so therefore, if this is a natural variability, it can't explain the explosive uh, change in climate in the last 10, 15 years. I hope I've been able to uh, apprise you of that. A few summary conclusions before we um, go off into the weekend. Uh, main short-term natural influences on climate change are include volcanoes, like Mount Pinatubo, uh, solar variability, these are sunspots, internal climate system variability, such as uh, ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillations, but also uh, the North Atlantic Oscillations. Natural variability can only explain about uh, 0 0.4 degrees of difference. So we've seen a lot more than that. And that's plus or minus. So uh, very, uh, natural climate variability can also cool our planet. Warming, however, therefore, in the last century has exceeded the bounds of natural variability. So it must have another explanation. The uh, most logical, um, overwhelming evidence is that the rise of greenhouse gases from human activities uh, is the cause. And it is possible that human activities may increase climate variability as well as climate itself. Remember, um, we see not only an increase in the uh, temperature, global mean temperature, but we also see a broadening of the uh, variation. So the colds are getting colder and the warms are getting warmer. Right, so the, the variability, if you s the average, let's say this is the average in the middle. The average is now getting warmer. 
So this is the average. But, ne but not only is the average getting warmer, but the variation from this average is getting bigger. So it's less predictable. It's, it's strengthening everything. So um, the, uh, except for a few things like tornadoes and uh, lightning, that's staying the same, but like uh, uh, the, the El Nino is, is getting worse. Uh, so the variability is getting higher. Not only is it uh, warmer, but it's less stable. That's, I guess, another word to say for it. Vari variation is stability. Yeah? Any more questions? Yeah, it's all words you can say. Yeah, you can say.